It's Shabam, sponsored in part by Google. Not helping, not helping. Truck, go right, no, go left. Ah. Last episode, the kids made it to Nadine's. Mm, these are awesome. And replenished their supplies. They're military ration protein bars. But with the house surrounded by Zinskis. What do we do? You guys get to the garage and get those bikes out. They had to make a tough choice. Okay. You guys ready? They loaded up their packs with a few days' worth of water and food, made their escape on bikes. Got it, go, go! Now, they're headed to the Vandenberg safe zone via the freeway oh, and pedal faster. because it's the quickest route and, as Nadine pointed out when they were still in the house, the freeway is usually above the surface streets, so we're less likely to run into any Zinskis. Go, go! Come on! Now, if we were trying to get from Culver City to Vandenberg, how would we get there? And how long would it take? A quick check on Google Maps shows us that it's 155 miles from Nadine's house to the Vandenberg Air Force Base. Please proceed to the highlighted route. Which, if you follow the navigation of your GPS or listen to Siri, should take around two hours and 40 minutes. If you take the most direct route with the freeways, and you assume there's not that much traffic, Recalculating. which could change at any time. So I'm estimating five hours and 53 minutes. We could take a car that runs on gas, or we could take an electric car like Mel's Tesla. Oh, it's hot in here. It's hot. And the car says we'd get there with 17% battery charge left. But there are other forms of transportation that could get us to Vandenberg, like trains and buses. Google estimates that with public transportation, it would take us about 18 hours, including transfer times. If we were flying in a Cessna, like my dad used to fly, we could take a slightly shorter straight path, which is 133 miles, and get there in little over an hour. And if we were flying in the Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird, with the rapid holder for the fastest aircraft in the world with an official top speed of 2,193 miles per hour. That's more than three times the speed of sound we could. Well, I could, since there's only two seats, and I can't fly a plane. Theoretically, I could get there in 3.6 minutes. These days, we have machines that get us places and computers that tell us where to go and how long it will take. You have arrived at your destination. So how does your phone know all this? First of all, there are sensors on the freeways that detect the size and speed of cars. That's how you get your traffic information. Your cell phone company knows where your phone is based on how close you are to the nearest cell phone towers. And Google has built a huge map with all kinds of data in it. And all this constantly updating information is merged using servers and then spit out onto your cell phone. Take the US 101 North exit toward Ventura. So you know where you're going and you can make plans. Aloha and welcome aboard. It's so easy to get around these days that you can leave Los Angeles by plane and land in a tiny island in the middle of the ocean six hours later. And this is considered routine. It happens 14 times a day. And still, what do we complain about? You know, why can't they make planes where you don't have to switch your phone to airplane mode? Enjoy your flight. So we're going to break up this episode into two parts because there are two main aspects of getting around. Transportation, which is what we use to get from place to place. And navigation, turn right, which is how we get from place to place. Part one, transportation. Okay, let's start off with a brief history of ground transportation. That sounds kind of boring, but it's really not. And since the kids are riding bikes, let's start with bikes. Here we go. The first usable bike was invented around 1817 by a German dude, and it was called Laufmaschine. <laughs> Super! Which means walking machine, because it had no pedals and you walk rode it. Bicycles with pedals came a few years later, and they're great because they combine the oldest form of human locomotion, the leg, with one of the most revolutionary human inventions, the wheel. No, the axle that connects the turning wheel to the not turning rest of the vehicle. And that was invented at 4.37 p.m. on November 18, 3200 B.C. That's not true. But we do know that a 5,000-year-old artifact known as the Ljubljana Marsh's wheel is the oldest known remains of a wheel with an axle. It's called the Ljubljana Marsh's wheel because it was found in a marsh near the Slovenian capital, Ljubljana. And 5,000 years ago, the cart with that wheel must have gotten stuck and sunk into the swamp. I told you the wheeled thing would get stuck if we went through the marshes. Which is why archaeologists believe that the idea of a wheeled transportation device, like a cart, appeared here first. This wheeled thing was a brilliant invention because now you could take an animal and hook it up to the wheeled thing and then it could pull it. So for thousands of years, land travel involved either your legs or the legs of an animal. Chariots, wagons, and carriages, the wheeled vehicles of the past, were all powered by the legs of something else. But unfortunately, a big problem with legs is that they get tired. Okay, it's getting dark. 
And Nadine looks tired. What? I think we should call it a night. You're right about the getting dark part, Elliot. The other problem with legs is that the animals with the legs, like horses and cows and humans for that matter, need to do all kinds of inconvenient things like eat and drink, which takes up time. And then there's the biggest time suck. Where do we, uh, sleep? Um, in those. <clears throat> this one's locked. Come on. This one's locked too. Before the 1800s, our main forms of land transportation relied on animals. And a downside of relying on animals that need to eat and sleep is that a lot of time and energy is spent keeping those animals alive. And there's another downside. They aren't all that powerful. Take a horse. There's a limit to how much a horse can pull. And there's a limit to how many horses you can hook up at once. Therefore, there's a limit to how much stuff you can pull. This, by the way, is where the term horsepower comes from. When something has an engine rated at 140 horsepower, it means it can do the work of 140 horses. So, by the 1800s, people had been hooking up wheeled things to domesticated animals for thousands of years, and they knew that it's not practical to hook up more than about eight animals at a time. So, people were looking for ways to increase horsepower without the horse part. The steam engine had been around for 20 years, but it wasn't until the early 1800s that the British were able to hook it up to a locomotive, which took the animals out of the equation. They had lots of power, so they could haul lots of stuff. As long as the coal was burning and the water was boiling, they would just run, no need for sleep. By the 1830s, Germany and the US started building trains too. And from then until the early 1900s, trains dominated land transportation. When the Transcontinental Railroad was completed on May 10, 1869, it not only gave people the ability to travel from coast to coast, but it also allowed lots of stuff to get transported to towns that didn't have seaports. Trains and the cargo they brought are what developed the Western United States. The Transcontinental Railroad was an engineering marvel. Laying all that track, cutting through mountains, building bridges over rivers was dangerous and expensive. But travel was still limited. Trains only ran at certain times and only went along certain routes. So from 1800 to 1900, there were inventors all over the world experimenting with making powered vehicles that didn't need animals or tracks and could give you personal travel freedom. What was slowly taking shape was the age of the car. There's a zombie apocalypse and I have to flee for my life. I know, I should probably lock my car and take the keys. This one's open! And it's a Mercedes SUV! Oh, Sleeping in style. Speaking of Mercedes Benz, in 1888, Carl Benz, the guy after whom the Benz part is named, was the first to mass produce an automobile that ran on gas. By the time the First World War started in 1914, companies all around the world were making cars that ran on gas or steam, like the Ford company that was working on the Model T. So you might have noticed that we mentioned this period of 1800 to 1900 quite a bit on Shabam. And that's because it was during this era that all sorts of world-changing inventions came into being, like the battery in 1800, the tin can in 1810, the stapler in 1841. The stapler. Yeah, that's huge. Yes, the stapler. How else are you going to keep two pieces of paper together without <laughs> having them fall apart? <laughs> that's life-changing. Typewriter, 1829, antiseptics, light bulbs, alternating current, the zipper, and dynamite. All right, back to cars. When Henry Ford came out with the Model T in 1908, the age of cars had arrived. Obviously, they didn't have all the modern accessories like an array of cameras and a dashboard monitor and side mirror mounted spotlights. Because this is the Ford F1. But they also didn't have a bunch of things that we might think are pretty standard. Forget heated seats or radios. It didn't even have a speedometer and no turn signal or windshield wipers or even a gas pedal. You controlled speed with a lever on the steering wheel and the top speed was about 45 miles per hour. And from then on, cars just kept getting better and better and more sophisticated. Nowadays, cars are full of computers that even tell you when you're falling asleep. Automobiles dominate travel in most countries and have become a symbol of personal travel freedom. With a car, you can pretty much go wherever you want, whenever you want. And there's space in the back to put your stuff. The trunk. Did you know that a trunk is called a boot? In England? I did. Did you know that boot is called a Wellington? No, I did not know that. Wellington. Yes, Wellington. Wellies. Wellies are boots. And brawlies are umbrellas. Ha! And knickers Okay, but are... also when they say 
crisps, they mean chips, and then when they say chips, they're talking about fries. Okay, but what are they talking about when they say fries? Really? What? What? <laughs> are you two finished? Because the kids are also having a conversation about food, and we're missing it. Please tell me you packed more of those magic military ration protein bars. I did. Thank Sweet. God. Also, beef jerky, trail mix, emergency boxed water, fire starter, mylar. What's mylar? It's a super warm plastic blanket. My dad carries one with him everywhere. It looks like folded up tinfoil. NASA uses it in their spacesuits. Thanks, Wikipedia. Also, I threw in my dad's multi-tool, a first aid kit, some hats for the sun, toilet paper, dibs, flashlights. You mean Zinsky attractors. And since someone crashed the car and left our solar panel behind, <sighs> come on. I figured a hand radio would help. Brilliant! A hand crank radio! We need one of those. We have one of those. Nadine's holding it. That's not what I'm... But a vehicle is only half of what you need to get around so easily. In order for cars to go so fast, you need to drive on something that's smooth, like the freeway that the kids are on. Vandenberg, they said Vandenberg. At least we're on the right track. Is there ever any doubt? Go to sleep, Elliot. So no scary campfire stories about freeway monsters? Not funny, Elliot. There once was a zombie Stop. named Zinsky. When the Model T was introduced, roads were a mess. They were basically dirt paths that turned into muddy rivers when it rained. Driving was still a novelty. It was bumpy, slow, and kind of a pain. This is kind of a pain! Yeah, but we're going 20 miles an hour! Then, in 1926, the first highway system was created. This new network of roads gave trucks and cars a way to go all over the place. Cars could go faster, and they could go wherever they wanted, whenever they wanted, which means more stuff and more people could move around more. Okay, let's fast forward 30 years. 1956. Look at all this traffic. So finally, America gets the big interstate highway system. More lanes and straighter paths, which meant faster transport. That's why today, when you look at the highways and all the numbers, some of them say I-95 or I-15, which is the interstate system built in the 50s, and some say US-23 or US-101, which is the US highway system built in the 20s. A great trick about these two highway systems is that they were designed so you could get a sense of where they go just by looking at the numbers. Roads with even numbers usually go east-west. Like historic US Route 66, which runs from Chicago to Los Angeles. Roads with odd numbers usually go north-south. Like Interstate 5, which runs from San Diego to Seattle. And the easiest way to remember that is that the words even, east, and west all have an E in them, and the words odd, north, and south all have an O in them. This is our transportation network that connects all our cities and towns from Maine to California and to Hawaii. You think so? To Hawaii? No. But you could drive to Alaska if you wanted to. Why? Because Canada also has a highway system. <laughs> In fact, without good transportation networks like roads and trains, you can't have a successful country with a happy, healthy population. You need to be able to move stuff and people around easily. You need roads. So in the last episode, when we talked about moving food around in trucks, or in episode four, when we talked about sending messages via horseback, the thing they have in common is roads. But for now, let's get back to the kids who are on the 101 freeway, which was built in 1926. Currently, it is littered with abandoned cars, including the Mercedes S-Class SUV that has been baking in the morning sun for three hours. Oh, good God, it's hot. <sighs> Owen, wake up, move over. <sighs> Oh, oh my. Oh. Whew, that's better. Let's see what's going on. Back to the following counties. Los Angeles, Ventura. Mm. That's the same message as before. It must be recording. They say Vandenberg, but are you guys sure we're going the right way? I know we took the 101 to get there. Why do you guys say the before all of the freeway numbers? Uh, what are you talking about? In Wisconsin, we didn't say the 94, it's just 94. <laughs> Whatever, explain cheese curds. Cheese curds are the best. Whether it's the simple dirt paths of the past or complex megasystems of the modern era, transportation networks are what allow us the freedom to travel pretty much wherever we want. Even if we choose not to use these roads, we still have the option to do so. And it's easy to forget that this freedom didn't always exist. For everyone. I think it's go back in time time again. To help us tell this story, we talked to Richard Blackett, a historian of the abolitionist movement from Vanderbilt University, and Professor Barbara McCaskill, professor of English at the University of Georgia in Athens, Georgia. 
Okay, we're back in 1848. James Polk is president of the United States. There's no electricity yet, no planes, no cars, and the U.S. highway system wouldn't get built for another 78 years. The main form of transport was a ship, like a steamship, or a carriage drawn by horses, or a train. And by the way, the train system was a mess in the South because all different companies owned all different railroads and different stretches of track, some of which weren't even the same gauge. Gauge is the width of the tracks. 1848 is also the era of slavery in the US. There's more than three million people enslaved in the South, men, women, and children. The overwhelming fear among slaves is the prospect of being separated from their family by being sold further south. And in many instances, when you read some of the explanations of why slaves run away, that is the overwhelming reasons that they give. Because they have seen it happen before, and they know it's likely that it could happen to them at any time. The last story we're going to tell in part one is a story about transportation and escape. William and Ellen Craft were enslaved people working in the same household in Macon, Georgia. They wanted to get married, but they were reluctant to because they would have children, and under the slave system, those children would be slaves. So they delayed getting married. Ellen knew all too well how little control an enslaved person had over their own lives and the lives of their kids. When Ellen was 11 years old, she was taken away from her mother, given as a wedding gift to her half-sister, Eliza. Okay, let's pause here to explain Ellen's backstory because it's a little complicated. Ellen's father was a white slave owner. Ellen's mother was one of his slaves. Ellen's father had another daughter with his white wife, and that daughter's name was Eliza. So Ellen and Eliza were half-sisters, but Eliza was white and Ellen was mixed race. Eliza ended up marrying another white slave owner from Macon. And then Ellen's father, also her owner, took her from her mother and gave her to Eliza, her half-sister, as a wedding present. And in Macon, that's where Ellen met William, who worked for the same slave owner. They knew that in order to truly be able to control their own lives, they had to get out of slavery. They had to escape. William and Ellen hatched a daring plan that had never been tried before. They would escape not under the cover of darkness, but in broad daylight. Because of Ellen's light skin, they decided to dress her as a wealthy white man and have William travel as her slave. Together, they would use public transportation to get to Philadelphia in the free north. This was a gutsy idea. It required lots of planning, like secretly buying clothes and supplies and timing the escape during the Christmas break so they wouldn't be missed. But there were other huge obstacles. First of all, neither one of them could read or write. So they couldn't just read train schedules. They had to remember snippets of conversation they heard from the wealthy white people around them. I think we can suspect that William and Ellen Craft had excellent, highly refined memories. To avoid having to write, they wrapped Ellen's arm in a sling. But it was still a problem. Because under slave law, every state that you cross with a slave, the slaveholder had to sign that this was his slave. Another problem was that dudes in 1848 had mustaches and beards. They decided to wrap a bandage around her face and pretend that she had a toothache. This type of bandage is called a poultice. Really, what that bandage intended to do was to prevent people from wondering why a grown man didn't have any facial hair. <laughs> that was the issue. It also gave her an excuse not to talk because perhaps the biggest danger was that by deciding to take public transportation in broad daylight, the more interactions they had, the higher the risk of getting caught. Southerners were on the alert. They were on high alert for African-Americans who were escaping slavery. Places of transport, railroad stations, ports, ship docks were very well guarded. With a convincing disguise and a plausible story, William and Ellen boarded a train from Macon to Savannah. All aboard! And in the very first leg of their journey, someone Ellen knew sat across from her. And she had to carry on a conversation <laughs> with this woman for quite some time, hoping against hope that she would not be detected. And they talked about why she was going to Philadelphia. And of course, the fact that she was ill and her face was wrapped in a poultice won her a lot of sympathy, even from somebody who should have recognized her. So that was a close call. But their troubles were only beginning, because once in Savannah, there's no straight shot up to Philly like there is now. 
to get there, they had to take a steamship to Charleston, South Carolina, another steamship to Wilmington, North Carolina, a train, another ship, and another train. From a vehicle standpoint, that's already a grueling trip. Another thing to keep in mind is that even though they were escaping together, they couldn't really travel together. They can't sit side by side most of the time. Because William is pretending to be Ellen's slave, he has to sit in a separate carriage with the other enslaved black people anytime Ellen is on the train. So there's always the risk when you change in trains, you lose connection with one another because she might be in the front of the train and he is in the back, which of course creates another kind of danger because there's one instance in which William oversleeps and when she is ready to leave, he is nowhere to be found. Both of them had to be able to use their wits because for a large part of the journey, they wouldn't even be together. So they're traveling through a disjointed transportation network, unable to read or write, and also unable to communicate even with each other for most of the time through places that are looking to capture people like them. It's not surprising they had a few close calls. They had to get a ferry. And she had to sign a piece of paper that said William is her slave. But of course she can't write. And even though she explained to the clerk that her writing hand was in a sling, the clerk insisted that she use her other hand to sign her name. That's one of those moments when it appears the escape is going to fail. And she was sweating bullets at that point. And who comes to the rescue is a young southerner man. He must have been impatient or he might have taken issue with the clerk's attitude. We don't know what the reason was, but he spoke up on Ellen's behalf and basically said to the clerk, you see this man is ill. Don't you see this is a sick, very sick man? His hand is in a sling. He can't be expected to write. You need to let him go. And and the ferryman say, well, would you pledge that this man is who he say he is and this is his slave? And the young man said, I will vouch for him. <laughs> and this is someone who didn't even, he just wanted to get on the ship. <laughs> he didn't really know Ellen. When they finally got to Philadelphia three days later, they had traveled through the lion's den in plain sight and made it out alive. And every step on the train, they were almost caught, and the hotels where they were staying, they were almost caught, so that on each step of the journey, they ran the risk of being caught and taken back into slavery. William and Ellen Craft had traveled more than a thousand miles using fewer transportation options than we have today during a time when they were basically being hunted. Fast forward to today. So the ease of transportation that we enjoy today is something to cherish. We have vehicles that move fast and give us great autonomy over when and where we go. And we have roads and train tracks that make using these vehicles possible. And we live in a time and place where we have the freedom to go pretty much wherever we want. Though not nearly as difficult as the craft journey, the kids have another long day of riding ahead of them. The sign up ahead says 23 goes to the right. We want to stay to the left. How much farther do you guys think it is? Tired, Nadine? No, just worried about food and water, Elliot. It was like three hours on the bus, but there was a ton of traffic. Uh, I think we have a few more days ahead of us. So at this point, the kids have ridden 26 miles and have about 133 more to go before they get to Vandenberg. Wait a minute. Now, if you're about to email us because you went back to part one and you calculated the math and found out that the mileage doesn't match, stop typing. Oh. Okay, because actual distances change depending on what route you choose. Okay. And what determines what route you choose? Part two, navigation. When Paul Revere was riding through Massachusetts waking people up who were already awake, he wasn't using a map. He pretty much knew where to go already. In colonial times, most people had to know which path went where because there were no easy to read street signs and no local pocket maps. At this point, we could go into the history of cartography or map making, which is all very interesting and amazing, but we're not going to. What? You're not gonna talk about how the Chinese had the first hyper accurate maps thousands of years ago? No. 
come on! And we're not going to mention that a lot of early maps were just basically made up, like in the 1700s when Spanish map makers made maps of America without actually leaving Spain. That sounds like a cool story! And we're certainly not going to mention that before the 1940s, when satellites with cameras were shot in orbit, we didn't really know what the places being mapped actually looked like. You're not going to talk about that either? Instead, we're going to sum up the history of map making in three words. Maps got better! And now we've got Google Maps! As mentioned in the beginning of part one, with technology like Google Maps, you see everything nicely labeled like roads and neighborhoods and parks and stores. Computer programs look at collected satellite imagery and they mix that with pictures that they get from people driving around in those Google cars with cameras on them. That gets fed to a huge server and then computer programs sift through all these pictures looking at signs and street markings. Plus there's a ton of information that gets submitted from people all over the world using Google Maps, providing feedback about errors or submitting businesses. This is a lot of data, but it's also a completely new kind of map. You know, maps used to be made out of paper, and to zoom in, you moved it closer to your face. <laughs> the virtual map of the world that Google has created is a constantly updating model of reality. I would say it's the most accurate map that's ever been created, but it's still a map. And the reason why it works is because shapes on paper correspond to big things on land that don't change like mountains, valleys, and coastlines. Wait, oh, and Vandenberg is on the coast, right? Yeah. We've been riding for almost two days, and I haven't even seen the ocean. I know we have to take the 101. Nadine, you didn't happen to pack a map, did you? Yeah, Elliot, it's right here. I've been keeping it from you this whole time. Okay, okay, sorry I asked. The idea of changing or marking up the land so you can make a landmark is nothing new. Many cultures like the Romans in Europe or the Mughals in India dropped stones in the road that indicated distances. These were called milestones. They didn't put it in the middle of the road, they put it on the side. Yeah, why would you put it in the middle? Just move it over to the side. The Comanche Native Americans would take young trees and bed them so they would grow into unusual shapes. These marker trees served as living signposts. And in the early days of American roads, like the 19 teens, instead of numbered signs, colors and shapes were used to designate a route. And there were no consistent signposts. The color and shapes that identified each route, like a red ball or red star, were painted on shingles that were then attached to telephone poles, barns, fences, or trees. And when a bunch of routes intersected or used the same road, you got a big mess. Well, that's the wrong route. We're not on that route. Remember, the route we're on is Red X. We're looking for Red there X. There's no Red X. Okay. There's Blue Triangle, Green Star, Red Star, Red Triangle, Green Ball, and Purple Square. That's Mauve. There is no Mauve Square. There's Lavender and there's Purple but there's no yeah, mo. Check no the mo. book. Check the book, okay? Check the book. The official automobile blue book was the early 1900s version of Google Maps, which listed routes from one place to another and gave step-by-step -step instructions. So, for example, there'd be two pages of instructions on getting from Chicago, Illinois to Fort Wayne, Indiana, and it read like your neighbor giving you directions. 3.5 miles, end of the road at the schoolhouse, turn left over railroad bridge, keep straight ahead, turn left, follow along lagoon, turn right around water tower. So this is all great when navigating over land, but on the ocean it's a little different. Everything looks the same in every direction, and it's water, so it's always changing. You can't put up signposts, so without a way to match what you see around you to the map you're looking at, you can get lost. And most of the Earth is covered in water. Before GPS, humans that traveled the open ocean had to use something else that told them where they were. And that something was the sky. We gotta keep going north and west. So the later in the day it gets, as long as we keep the sun in front of us or on our left, we're still going in the right direction. The basics of using the sky to navigate, or celestial navigation, is simple to understand, but actually doing it is pretty hard. The sky is basically the universe that you can see from Earth, and the Earth is surrounded by the same sky every night of the year. Depending on where you are on the planet, you'll see different part of the sky. Again, think of it like a big picture that surrounds the Earth. And here's where it gets complicated! The first problem is that the Earth is spinning, so the sky looks like it's constantly moving around us. So the sky at 8 p.m. looks different than it does at 4 a.m. The second problem is that the Earth is also revolving around the sun. So 8 p.m. in March will look different than 8 p.m. in September. In a bit, we'll get a little bit more into how complicated this is. But right now, the kids are using the easiest celestial navigation tool, the sun, which rises in the east and sets in the west. In California, the coast is to the west. So if you head to where the sun sets, you'll hit the ocean. 
in theory. What's that supposed to mean? It means that we haven't actually seen the ocean. You know, that giant mass of blue stuff that people like to swim in? I'm sure we're going the right way. Have you ever noticed how people tend to fight when they don't know where they're going? Uh, and, oh, and you remember the ocean quite well. That's where you wiped out in front of the whole class on your boogie board and lost your swim trunks. Shut remember up, that? Elliot. You shut up. Guys. At least I didn't get sand in my mouth and cry like a little baby for 20 minutes. Oh, and... Yeah, there was tar in that sand. No, there wasn't. Guys! What? what? Look up. Giant mass of blue stuff. See, I told you. Whatever. I'm stopping for the night. I think we should go a little farther. Do what you want. I'm done. Fine. This one's open. Elliot, what are you doing? You guys can sleep in that one. I'm sleeping over here. That's a stupid idea. You're a stupid idea. Elliot, you're being a jerk. Whatever. I don't know why he gets like that. He's just tired. Here, Owen. You can have the last chocolate protein bar. Get some sleep. Everything's always better in the morning. Since we started part two, the kids have ridden 27 miles, but they probably have another four days of riding to go. But keep in mind, even though they don't know exactly how to get to Vandenberg, they know that the Air Force Base exists, and they also roughly know where it is. This is much different than the early explorers who had no idea where they were going or what was out there. The explorers of the past who get the most play are Europeans like Ferdinand Magellan and Captain Cook. Whose intrepid spirit and amazing navigation skills allowed them to circumnavigate the globe in these first voyages of human discovery. Magellan never made it all the way around the globe. Only one of his ships did in 1522. Magellan got as far as what we know today as the Philippines. And then he picked a fight with the locals and was killed <laughs> along with a bunch of his crew. About 50 years after Magellan, Sir Francis Drake commanded the first circumnavigation, but his main goal was picking fights, not exploring. The most famous explorer did it 200 years later. And that was Captain Cook, a British dude who traveled the Pacific. I'm not a dude. I'm Captain James Cook, navigator, explorer, and cartographer in His Majesty's Royal Navy. Thank you very much. Eventually, he landed in Hawaii, picked a fight with the local Hawaiians, and got himself killed. Yeah. Europeans weren't the only ones navigating the open oceans. More than 100 years before Magellan, a Chinese admiral named Zheng Hua Zheng he. was exploring the Indian Ocean and east coast of Africa. From 1405 to 1431, this guy made seven voyages with a fleet of over 150 ships and tens of thousands of people, which is incredible. And just to put that in perspective, Magellan's fleet was five ships, and Cook used one. Not everyone has a government willing to spend lots of money on sea exploration like Zheng Hua. Zheng he. And all these guys used tools to read the sky and navigate the ocean. So how'd they do that? If you want to use the sky as a way to tell you where you are on the Earth, you need reference points, or things in the sky that correspond to positions on Earth. And if you look up into the night sky, the stars are constantly rising in the east and setting in the west. And this is because... I know this. Don't say anything. The Earth is spinning and we're on it. Oh, I said don't say anything. So how do you find these reference points if you're always moving? Let's step back again and imagine the Earth spinning in your mind, surrounded by stars. And you can even put a little 23 degree tilt to be accurate. The North Pole is at the top, the South Pole is at the bottom, and the equator is halfway between the poles. And as you're imagining this, you can see the North and South Pole always stay in the same place as the Earth spins. So you can use the North and South Poles as reference points. And this is why, if you know what you're doing, you can use the angle of specific stars to the horizon to tell you how far North or South you are from the equator. This is your latitude. An easy way to measure that is with a thing called a sextant, which is that telescope with the triangle looking thing underneath it that allows you to measure the angle between the horizon and anything in the sky. The way you figure out your east-west location, or longitude, longitude, is more complicated because there are no reference points. It's like trying to figure out where you are on a carousel based on what you see Where are you? whizzing past you. I just passed the control booth. Where? It's gone now, and now I'm passing the hot dog vendor. I just see the control booth. Just passed the tree. You should see the hot dog vendor soon. That doesn't tell me where you are. Oh, oh, there's the hot dog you vendor. You see a tree. Guys, that doesn't help. These are moving reference points. I can't tell where you are based on what you're seeing. I see the control booth. The Earth is like a giant carousel that spins around once a day. So regardless of your east-west location or longitude, every 24 hours, the same things show up. One big thing in the sky that's hard to miss and shows up every day is our closest star, the sun. 
Once every day, that thing is at its highest point in the sky. And we synchronize our clocks to the spin of the Earth so that noon corresponds to when the sun is at its highest point. And this happens for everyone, but like the passing control booth, it just happens at different times depending on where you are. For example, when it is noon in Los Angeles, it's 3 p.m. in New York and 9 p.m. in Berlin. That's because New York is east of LA and Berlin is much more east than LA. So let's say it's 1700s and you're on a ship in the middle of the ocean. If you know that the sun is at the highest point in the sky at your location or noon, and you know what time it is at your reference location, you can tell how east or west from your reference location you are. Now, 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 let me explain it again. This clock is set with the local time back home. London. Yes, London. We all know London, because that's yes. where we're from. Right? Oh, I'm from Bristol. Manchester. Uh, pack it in, all right? The ship left London, so for the purposes of this explanation, we're from London, all right? Yes. This clock shows the time in London where the ship is from. Right? Right. Oh, right? right? We all know that the sun is at the highest point where we are. Where's that? <sighs> That's what we're trying to figure out. Right. So since the sun is at its highest point where we are, we know it's noon right here. It's not what it says on the clock. Yes, oh, that's right. because this clock is set to the time in London. Where oh. we're from? I'm not. I'm oh. from Ireland. What does the bloody clock say? 3 p.m. Mm. Right, so if it's noon where we are and it's 3 p.m. in London, where we're from? Shh, then we know that we're in the middle of the ocean, three hours west of London. Middle of the ocean? I could have told you that just by looking over the side. <sighs> the trick is calculating exactly where the highest point of things in the sky like the sun are. The only way to know that is to look at astronomical charts that predict where things should be throughout the year. Also, you need a clock to be able to tell time accurately. Actually, on Captain Cook's last voyage, he was testing out a more accurate clock called a chronometer. He also had a bunch of astronomical charts and a sextant that he brought with him. Basically, he had a lot of stuff. But if you want to know who the first amazingly awesome ocean explorers were, you have to go back not hundreds, but thousands of years to the South Pacific. The settling of the Pacific Islands is the greatest human adventure story of all time. That's Doug Herman. Aloha mai kako. He started the interview by cursing us out in Hawaiian. No, no. In Hawaiian, I, I gave my Hawaiian name. Doug is the senior geographer at the National Museum of the American Indian in Washington, D.C., and one of his specialties is the history of how the Polynesians settled the South Pacific. We're talking about people using Stone Age technology to build voyaging canoes that could travel thousands of miles to find tiny dots of land in the middle of an ocean and then mark the those positions in their minds and then go back and forth and back and forth to settle these islands. 3,500 years ago, the Polynesians began exploring the open ocean and settled pretty much every habitable island in the Pacific. An area in the ocean now known as the Polynesian Triangle. Three corners of the Polynesian Triangle being Hawaii to the north, New Zealand to the southwest, and Rapa Nui, or Easter Island, to the southeast. This also includes the Cook Islands, named after Captain Cook, who discovered them a thousand years after they were already discovered by the Polynesians. And they went even further. Without a doubt, they went all the way to the Americas and back by, at the latest, 1200 AD. Think about this. These guys hit the Americas 200 years before the voyages of Zheng He, Zheng he. or Christopher Columbus. And that's why the Europeans kept landing on islands with people on them that all spoke the same language. Captain Cook, who went down to Tahiti in the late 1700s, was the first one to recognize this. Because when he landed in Hawaii, which is about 2,600 miles north of Tahiti, he had a Tahitian on board who was able to communicate with the Hawaiians. That is to say, the languages were close enough to be mutually intelligible. And so Captain Cook said, and this is a quote, How shall we account for this nation spreading itself over this vast ocean? The only way to account for this is if these explorers were really the masters of the open ocean. It's really right up there with sending men to the moon. And before we get into how they did this, we're going to check back with the kids who are waking up to a surprise. Owen, wake up. What? I'm, Shh. I'm... Don't move. Don't make any noise. There are three Sinskis moving toward Elliot's car. What the? What did you do that for? Pack all the stuff and get ready to run. What are you doing? Hey, over here, Sinski! Oh my god! You can't even get the camera slow. Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh, when you're nuts. Brilliant, but nuts. 
Owen, I'm clear. Ride, we'll catch up. Did you tell him to do that? No. That was brave. Is that as fast as you guys can ride? Owen, thanks. Anytime. And how about from now on we sleep in the same car? Deal. And I get your share of beef jerky. Uh, that may be a problem. What? Why? I left my pack in the car. No, not again, Elliot. Well, at least we know we're going the right way. And the view's nice. Elliot losing his stuff brings up an important point about modern navigation versus Polynesian navigation. Google Maps on your smartphone, GPS, compasses, sextants, star tables. That's all stuff that can break or you can lose. Whoa, whoa, no, 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 no. Polynesian navigation doesn't rely on stuff. And so usually when people think about finding your way in modern times, they think about a compass or a GPS or even a watch. And so we don't have any of these on board. Jenna Ishii is part of the Polynesian Voyaging Society. And I'm an apprentice navigator on board Hokulea. Hokulea is a life-size replica of the double-hulled canoes that the ancient Polynesians used to use to sail all over the Pacific. There are two hulls, and it's connected by these cross beams that we call yako. And on top of that is a deck. And in the middle of the deck are two masts with sails. The hulls aren't made of wood like they traditionally would have been. They're made out of fiberglass. But like the ships of the past... Everything is lashed together with line, about five miles of lashing. So there's no nails or screws. There wouldn't be any metal on it, because metal corrodes in seawater. That's Doug Herman again, who's also a member of the Polynesian Voyaging Society. And actually lashing something together gives it a little bit of flexibility. So under strain, things will tend to flex rather than snap. And since its construction in 1976, Hokulea has made numerous trips to islands all over the South Pacific. The same trips that the Polynesians made hundreds of years ago. Okay, let's dive into the basics of this navigation stuff. Early on, we talked about finding your latitude, which is how north or south you are, by measuring the angle of things in the sky to the horizon. Zheng he. did it with a stack of boards and a string. Captain Cook used a sextant, and the Polynesian navigators used... Our hands. Before we learned to voyage, we actually use our bodies uh, to calibrate degrees and angles. I've calibrated my hand ahead of time. The top of my index finger from the bottom of the horizon is 15 degrees. And so if I measured the North Star on the top of my index finger, I would be at 15 degrees north. But that's just the beginning. Navigating by the stars means you basically have to memorize the sky, which seems impossible. Because you just see dots everywhere. And that's a lot to remember. There are reference stars that point to certain islands, zenith stars that, if they're overhead, tell you if you are at certain latitudes. So the zenith star for the Hawaiian Islands, for example, is... That one! Hokulea, Star of Gladness. Like the canoe! Stars can also be used to tell you direction. The navigators of the Polynesian Voyaging Society do this with a mental picture. It's called the Hawaiian Star Compass. And it works by orienting the world around you so you know where you're headed. And it's modeled after the Micronesian Star Compass. Which has been passed down through generations. And explaining how it works can get a little complicated. First, you divide the horizon into 32 sections, or houses. Each house is 11 and a quarter degrees. And it's called a house because... Where are you when you get up in the morning? You're at home. In a house. Where are you when you go to bed at night? You're at home. In a house. In between, you're somewhere else. So for the stars that get up in the east and go to bed in the west, the houses are mirrored in the north and south. And a star that rises in the house called Manu on the east will set in the house called Manu on the west. And Hokulea rises in the house of Aina, which is 19 degrees north and Already you see how complicated this is getting, but basically... If you know where the stars live and where they rise and where they set, then throughout the day and throughout the year, you can match the moon and you can match the sun and you can match the waves and the wind to those stars. So you can tell, for example, which way the wind is blowing or the waves are flowing. And this is all great if the stars are out, but what if it's cloudy? Maybe about a fifth of the time that you're voyaging, you're going to have a clear night sky. So you can't just use the stars. The whole use of the stars is only one aspect of the navigation. It's the most obvious one, but actually, to me, the much more fascinating one is the use of ocean swells. Or waves. Not only can you see it visually once you're trained to do so, but you can feel it. 
So if we're going to sail from Hawaii to Tahiti, let's just say we're going from north to south. Let's keep it really simple. And let's say it's winter time in Hawaii and there's a big north swell. Meaning waves are coming from the north and going south. So if you place the predominant swell right behind you, it's going to lift the back of your canoe, it's going to roll under you and come out the front. So all day long, you're basically lifting the back and then it's lifting the front. But if your steersman falls asleep or if you decide to change course, one side of your canoe is going to start lifting before the other. And then you know you're not going south anymore. You're going either east or west of that. Now this sounds simple, but you got to remember there's more than one swell out there. There's wind swells, there's ground swells, there's this east wave that's always coming in the Pacific uh, from the northeast or the southeast. And so if you can find that east wave, you're never lost. The master voyagers could lie down in the hull of the voyaging canoe and just feel all of these different swells at once. They could even feel the change in swells that were created by islands beyond the horizon. If this seems like a lot to remember, it is. And we haven't even talked about tracking birds and looking at clouds and feeling the temperature of the water. The job of a navigator is so hard because you've got to keep track of all this stuff in your head. Every 30 minutes you're checking because you may slow down, you may go faster, and you're trying to average that out from sunrise to sunset. We're also calculating how far off our course have we deviated and for how fast and how long. So you're measuring speed and you're also measuring deviation over time. To get from Hawaii to Tahiti, for example, takes about a month. So that's a month of doing calculations in your head. I know, it's a lot of math. <laughs> so they say you can tell the navigator on the canoe because he's the one with the red eyes because he never sleeps. But there's one big difference between Polynesian navigation and stuff navigation. And it gets to the heart of what it means to be an ocean explorer. In our modern system of navigating with GPS and maps and so forth and so on, you're thinking about, well, where am I in terms of what degrees latitude, what degrees longitude, and so forth and so on. That's what the ships out at sea are trying to figure out all the time, to keep track of what is our latitude and longitude. For someone who's going someplace they've never been before, or sort of venturing out into the wild, you're not interested in your latitude and longitude. You're interested in how do I get home from here? So wherever you're going out in the wilderness around your home base, you are mentally somehow keeping track of where home is from where you are. So when the Polynesians began exploring the Pacific, they didn't know what was out there. For all they knew, the whole earth was covered in ocean. If you're venturing out into the big unknown, your lifeline, in case you don't find anything, is knowing how to get back to where you came from. The only way to know where you're going is to know where you came from. And that's, that's the biggest mental construct we use when we're learning to navigate. This idea of navigating by keeping track of your origin forms the basis for Polynesian navigation. These people were absolutely masters of the open ocean because the amount of knowledge that they had to have in order to accomplish what they did just takes us up to a whole other level of consciousness. It's a full-on sort of Zen awareness of every sensory aspect of your environment. So while there's all this technology available to us that holds information about where we are and how to get places, it has two big drawbacks. One, it's stuff we have to carry around with us and that can get lost. And two, it relies on a functioning communication network that may not always be functioning. The strength of Polynesian navigation is that it only requires one tool, and that's your brain, which is connected to you. It's what helped the crafts navigate from Georgia to Philadelphia. It's what the kids are using to make their way to Vandenberg. All right. While we were telling that story, a few days have passed for our kids. The day after the fight, they went another 20 miles. And the day after that, they went 30 miles. Because of their maneuverability on bikes, they were able to avoid any additional Zinsky close encounters. Now they're on their fifth day of riding, and it's getting harder. Unfortunately, their food and water supply has gotten really low. They've had to cut their water intake down to the minimum since Elliot left his backpack in Ventura. You have to bring that up again. And they've decided not to veer off course to look for more. We have to be getting close. And besides, looking for food and water just means spending more time which means we'll need more food and water. It's like an M.C. Escher drawing. What? What? Never mind. Uncultured. So wrapping it all up, getting around has never been this easy. We have machines that move us like trains, planes, and cars. 
We have structures that make it possible for these vehicles to work like roads and tracks. We also have machines that tell us where we are and how we get from one place to another. Like literally telling us where to go. We've become so dependent on these machines that we're in danger of forgetting how to navigate. This fear of forgetting is one of the reasons why Hokulea was created in the first place and why the Polynesian Voyaging Society teaches people like Jenna how to navigate without stuff. A lot of what Hokulea was trying to prove is that there was this ancestral route between Hawaii and Tahiti and the Polynesian Triangle and they did memorize their paths back and forth once they found that place. And so for us, it's like following in their footsteps and keeping that path alive and passing it on so it never goes extinct again. And they're not the only ones keeping older navigation techniques alive. In fact, the U.S. Navy teaches sailors how to navigate using the stars. It's not the complex voyaging that Jenna is learning. It's a lot more basic. But they learn it in the event that our satellite signals are jammed or destroyed. So this way, they won't be stuck. And if there's a zombie apocalypse and there are no more GPS signals, no more Google Maps, we'll have to rely on older ways of getting around. And that may mean looking at the sky or figuring out landmarks. But it also means we'll have to think more about getting around than we did before. For the kids, this means making a crucial decision at the town of Gaviota. Uh, the 101 goes that way. That's east. We need to stay near the ocean, which is west. Thank you, Magellan. There's also a sign for Highway 1. Should we take that? If the kids had a map, they would see that both the 1 and the 101 eventually go to Vandenberg. But they don't. Owen? What do you think? I think we should stick to what we know. Vandenberg is on the coast, we're on the coast. Let's stick to the coast. Agreed. Agreed. So at this point, they only have about 36 more miles to go. But they're tired and they're running out of food and water. How much water do we have? Three boxes. And we're down to two protein bars, a handful of trail mix, and one pack of jerky. We're also low on toilet paper. Great. The kids don't know this yet, but food and water aren't their only problems. Time to kill some zombies. Next time on Shabam. If you guys could eat anything right now, what would it be? Mangoes. By the way, in this episode, we mentioned Google Maps a lot. A mango smoothie. So we made our own Shabam Show Season 1 Google Map, which you can check out on our website. Coleslaw. At shabamshow.com. It's got the route that the kids are taking on it and some other cool stuff that we'll be adding on to it. Check it out. And now the credits. Shabam is produced by CC Herbert. I could eat like 10 burritos right now. Yeah. Your hosts, Mel Herbert, Josh Kurz, and Wendy Rodewice also created the show. Artichokes. Shut up. Recording that engineer and mixmaster is Bill like Connor. Like lots of Our voice actors are Steve Santucci, Rose Sengenberger, Chase Sawalinski, Dave Mason, and Art Kimbrough. If we get out of this, I'm taking you both to Wisconsin and we're all having cheese curds. Oh, you guys are making me so hungry. I'm thinking about growing a mustache. <laughs> Special thanks to Professor Richard Blackett. What? I could grow Professor one. Professor Barbara McCaskill. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you'll see. You'll see. Dr. Chris Reed, Jenna Ishii, Doug Herman, and Brian Cool. Oh, guys. I want to shower. Extra special thanks to Eugene Lee, who's Josh's oldest friend all the way back from junior high, and his sister, Wei Li, for the correct pronunciation of Chunhua. Zhenghe. He nailed it. Also featuring the musical stylings of Evil J and St. Cecilia. Okay, I got a question for you guys. Would you rather eat poison ivy or a handful of bees? Shabam is a production of Fuliboo Incorporated. Wait, are the bees alive or dead? Oh, they're alive. This episode of Shabam is sponsored in part by the making and science team at Google. And why is that, Cece? Because Google loves science. Obviously. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, would you rather... Do you love Shabam? We know you love Shabam. If you love Shabam, you should get a whole bunch of your friends to subscribe and comment, or maybe even go to patreon.com slash Shabam and support us. If you do, you get cool stuff every month, and we get a little help making the show. So if you can do that, it would be fantastic. Stella Reader. Would you rather drink a gallon of urine or a tablespoon of poop? Uh, I think I'd take the poop. Urine is technically sterile, so I think I took the urine.